All right, well, Happy New Year, everyone. Um, thank you for coming over here. Uh, I'm gonna talk about delirium in the intensive care unit, um, but before I go into um, talking about delirium, I thought um, I've been here at Regan Street for quite a while, um, since 2011. And um, I thought I'll show some pictures of my family because as, uh, as I'm getting older, the family is, get, is evolving as well. So I just thought I'll share some of the photos and for new folks, uh, that's my um, lovely wife, Irina Khan. She's a hospitalist at Eskenazi. She practices there and helps me implementing my work at Eskenazi Hospital. Oh, there you go. Okay. Yeah. Ah, all right, <laughs> perfect. Okay, yeah, so here we go. And um, these were my kids a uh, few years ago. I think the time when I started somewhere in, in Regan Street, the first few years at Regan Street, and you can see that they're growing, they're visiting the museum. Uh, actually, they're in the zoo at this time, and you can see a little bit younger version of me with not much gray. But in the last seven, eight years, you can see I'm becoming, um, as my wife said, I'm becoming a little bit more distinguished with the gray and sideburns. So I have no um, relevant conflicts um, relevant to this presentation. I get funding to do delirium work. Um, I also get funding from Regan Street Institute to did some pilots and I'm gonna talk about that here and some funding from Mayo. These are the objectives and uh, you guys uh, have already read them because they were in the CME disclosure um, that was provided to you. I'm gonna start with the case, a patient scenario because um, for the non-clinicians here just to uh, put it into perspective that uh, why do we even think about delirium and how could it present when you show up at my ICU at Eskenazi or any other ICU. So this is um, this was a case of an 80-year-old African-American female. She presented with altered mental status to Eskenazi. And according to the family, they noted a gradual decline in her mentation over the last few months. This was accompanied by decreased oral intake. She was ambulating and feeding herself prior to that. And then she was becoming gradually aggressive with knives and had outbursts of yelling. And she tended to throw away her clothes, waking up frequently at night, roam around, and was feeding cat food to herself. On the day of admission, she was found by her grandson, naked, semi-responsive, and emergency medical personnel were, were called. Um, her home medicines were unremarkable. She was taking etanol for blood pressure and vitamin D. She was found to be hypothermic, which is essentially a fancy term that your um, body temperature was low when you show up um, in the ER. Her other vitals were stable. She was not oriented, only, response, only responding to pain. She had dry mucous membranes, uh, kind of pointing towards dehydration. <laughs> And then um, her serum sodium level was 186. Now, what does that mean? I mean, our normal sodium level in the body is from 135 to 150. Um, 135 to 145, that's where you want to be. So if you start losing fluid or you don't drink or uh, you just forget to drink or any other such conditions, your sodium can start to creep up. And this is pretty high, 186, and it is, in emergent, it's an emergent situation. That's why she was brought to the ER. And this added sodium along with her age and underlying MCI can predispose you to develop altered mental status, which is a frequent complaint coming to the ICU. So she was admitted to our ICU. We started on IV fluids to drop her sodium levels, um, assessed with the CAM ICU for delirium. And I'll talk a little bit about the CAM ICU, which was positive. And then delirium protocol was administered, which include nursing-based uh, interventions and uh, also managing agitated delirium. Because one of the features, if you have delirium, you could be agitated, but that is not one of the cardinal features. You can be either agitated or you could be either lethargic. So what exactly is delirium? And you know, I've been talking about it. What is the technical definition? So this is the technical definition of delirium that you have acute brain failure. Essentially, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing with your brain. You have disturbance of consciousness, you have inattention, you have fluctuation that develops quickly and tends to um, fluctuate during the course of the day. And then I thought how to explain it to somebody. I was in Europe and I was walking on the street and I saw that statue 
in which you can see that one body is splitting apart. So this is some of the things that the patients have come to us after being admitted to the ICU and they've said that they felt that their head was splitting or their body was dissociating or they're just seeing things. And, and when I looked at that statue, then I looked at the title and the guy who made it also titled it as delirium. So I was like, you know, so this kind of puts into place that, okay, this is not happening to your body, but you're perceiving it that you're, something is happening and you're perceiving it as real and how distressful it could be when you're in the IC on a breathing machine with your hands tied down and you cannot talk to anybody about it and you cannot even come and move your body anywhere. So what is the prevalence of delirium in the ICU? So if you look at this, these numbers, we collected them a few years ago. And if you look at the ICU population, medical ICU and surgical ICU, if you're 18 and older, up to 28% patients in the ICU have prevalent delirium and in the surgical ICU was about 24%. But look at this, if you are 60 and older, look what happened to your numbers. They essentially doubled. And then the majority of the demographic getting admitted to the ICU at this time are over 60 years old. And this is gonna continue to increase. And I know Titus kind of keeps on saying that whenever I present, I kind of scare people, but all of us sitting in this room, if we don't die in a plane crash on some other calamity, we are getting old and we're gonna end up in the ICU before we die. So the number is like 1.8 per average adult American in the United States who are gonna end up in the intensive care unit. And if you're in the ICU, and if you're over 60, you can look at the prevalence. And this prevalence was people who were not mechanically ventilated, they were both mechanically and not mechanically. So if you're in a mechanical ventilator in the intensive care unit, and you're over 60 years of age, there's an 80% chance that you're gonna develop delirium at some point in the intensive care unit. Now, how do you diagnose it? You know, what, what, are, what, what are the things available for us? So this is a sedation scale. Before you start assessing people for delirium, you assess them for their level of sedation or level of arousal when they are in the intensive care unit. And focus on this number zero. Zero is alert and calm. So if I look at some of the folks here, I look at Burke, Brian, they are at the level of zero. They are alert and calm and they're, you know, now Burke is going in the negative range and is trying to sleep. <laughs> yeah. So as you keep on eating and you keep on going through my presentation, some of you are gonna start nodding off and that is when you become minus one, minus two, minus three. Once you reach no response to voice or tactile stimuli, then you're minus four or minus five and this is coma. And when you are comatose, you're not eligible for delirium assessment. So keep that in mind. And then as you become agitated, plus one, or you become anxious, like I'm standing in front of all of you and my heart rate is a little bit up, I'm maybe feeling a little bit anxiety as giving this presentation, I'm at plus one. But then if we keep on going up, and if I don't like your question and start throwing my water bottle and stuff, <laughs> then it becomes plus four. Um, so that's how the scale moves, the sedation scale in the intensive care unit. Now, if your RAS is minus three or above, that is you're anything other than comatose, you are eligible to be assessed through this scale called CAM-ICU. That has four items, which include acute onset of mental status change or fluctuating course, which means your level of sedation is fluctuating. You are inattentive, you have disorganized thinking, or you have altered level of consciousness. So if you have one, two, and three, or if you have one, two, and four, you are positive on the CAM-ICU assessment for delirium, and that could and then you could be screen positive and you would be labeled as having delirium in the intensive care unit. So this was the study done. And then um, in this study, they just validated the CAM ICU it published in 2001. And what Wes did, who's the primary author of this study, he trained two nurses to do the CAM ICU and he compared it with the geriatrician or a psychiatrist based assessment, which was the gold standard. And the psychiatrist just go, they went in there, they assess the patient, they go through all the diagnostic and statistical manual criteria. And then they see what is the, what are the test characteristics of CAM ICU? And you can look at the sensitivities and specificities over there. They were pretty good for, the, for identifying people with delirium or ruling them out in the intensive care unit. It took two minutes to do the CAM ICU on average, compared to close to 45 minutes to assess for delirium if you're a psychiatrist in the intensive care unit. So this kind of established that we can use CAM ICU in the intensive care unit, but here it was a yes or a no, either you have delirium or you don't have delirium, right? 
So at this time, around like close to 60, 70% of the ICUs are using ChemICU to assess for delirium. Now, what happens to you if you have delirium? I mean, why are we talking so much about it? What are some associations with it? So in this study, if you're in the intensive care unit and you were ever delirious compared to you were never delirious, you had a three times increased risk of death at six months from the time of admission. Now in this study, if you have increasing duration of delirium, as you can see, each increasing day of delirium was associated with a 10% increase in mortality at 365 days. So not only presence of delirium was so was found to be associated with mortality at six months, also the duration of delirium was found to be associated with mortality. Right. So with that in mind, we started some of the work that I'm gonna show because when I started doing this and I was in the ICU assessing the patients, the nurses and all of us were talking about it, you're like, okay, you have somebody with delirium, which is essentially a syndrome and constellation of features, but all you're doing is you're coming up with a yes or no. And then when you try to do some interventions, they may get somewhat better, but they will still stay delirious based on the CAM ICU assessment. And then the nurses were like, we need to identify a, through in some way that are their symptoms getting better or whether their delirium is improving or not improving on a spectrum. So we said, okay, we may need to create something, a tool that can capture the spectrum of delirium or, or delirium severity on a spectrum starting from zero up to a certain number. So we did this study. Um, it was done at Eskenazi Methodist and University ICUs. Um, we enrolled 518 patients, um, around 8,000 RAS and CAM ICU assessments were done from March 2009 to January 2015. And we compared the CAM ICUs um, or our RAS CAM ICU data to create a scale. We compared it with delirium rating scale revised, which is one of the bigger scales that is usually used by geriatricians and psychiatrists to diagnose for delirium or capture the symptoms of delirium. It has 13 severity items and the score goes up to 39 on that. The higher the score on DRSR 98, the higher is your delirium severity. And there were some cutoffs for identifying and not identifying delirium. So those were the inclusion criteria. People have to be greater than or equal to 18 admitted to the ICU have to have delirium based on CAM ICU, English speaking, and then have to have a legally authorized representative to be enrolled in the study. And then you can look at some of the exclusion criteria. These are because the CAM ICU is not validated in this population. Also, you cannot um, do those assessments when patients have these underlying criteria. All right. So the mean age of the patients in our cohort was 60. Half of them were females. Um, close to half were African-American. You can look at that about 60% were mechanically ventilated and the mean Apache 2 score was around 20, which is which denotes that, that they are severely ill. It's pretty high um, severity of illness in the intensive care unit. And their Charleston comorbidity index was 3.2. And what we did, we said, okay, we don't wanna come up with a scale right from scratch. We wanna use something that has already been used in about 60 to 70% of the ICUs across the United States. So we took all the items of CAM ICU and the way they are assessed, we broke them into an ordinal scale. So the first item was acute onset of fluctuation mental status. We said, okay, zero for absent, one for present. In attention, you have to do certain things in an attention which you have to squeeze on the letter A when you say a, a mnemonic to the patient. And then we calculate a score. If you can do that, that means an attention is absent, you get a score of zero. And if you start having an attention up to severe inattention, you get a score of one to two. And the same scheme for the other two items, disorganized thinking and an on altered level of consciousness. Now, altered level of consciousness, as you can see, is based on their RAS. A RAS of zero means alert and calm. So that means their altered level of consciousness is absent. And then as the RAS goes either positive or negative, you start getting a score. And we, we thought hard about this because we wanted to capture both agitated delirium and non-agitated delirium. Because in clinical practice, when you're agitated, you get a drug and you become sedated and you still stay delirious, which means that you're still having delirium, but people think that the delirium is getting treated. So that was some of the thinking behind giving the weightage on both positive and negative items. 
And then we did our um, usual statistics with the internal consistency reliability of that, and you got the Kronbox alpha of 0.85. And then we looked at it in different subgroups, and you can see that there is internally consistent there's reliability. Then we compared it with um, with DRSR98 with the construct validity, which shows that as your DRSR98 increases, your CAM ICU increases as well. Your correlation coefficient was found to be 0.67 in the overall population, which kind of tells us that our score is capturing the constructs as captured by DRSR98, although the number of items are less on that. Now, this is an interesting slide in which I like to show, and it highlights some of the difficulties in introducing scales in the intensive care unit because patients are mechanically ventilated and then it's difficult to ask them the questions. So you can see that the mean CAM ICU seven, if the score on the mean CAM ICU seven keeps on increasing as the number of items completed on the DRS 98 decreases. So that means that DRSR 98 in certain group of patients was not able to capture delirium severity, whereas the CAM ICU 7, because that does not require answering and you can assess some of the, with the squeeze and the knots, you can see that the patients who were not able to do DRSR 98, the CAM ICU 7 scores were higher in those denoting severe delirium based on this scale. Then we did known groups validity because certain groups may have higher delirium severity. Intubated patients were found to have higher CAM ICU-7 score compared to non-intubated patients. And as you get older, your CAM ICU-7 scores increases, which was significant, showing the known groups validity of the CAM ICU-7 scale. Now, this is a slide that one of the reviewers asked us to, um, to run the numbers uh, and what he wanted to find out that the CAM ICU-7 is performing at the edges of your RAS scale. Like if you're severely agitated with a score of two and three, or if you're severely sedated with a score of minus two and minus three, how your CAM ICU-7 distribution scores look like. And you can see this is your seven scores, and these are your seven scores, and at both spectrums of sedation, you're getting severe delirium. And that's why the numbers, the way the CAM ICU-7 uh, and the RAS score was incorporated in the CAM ICU-7. Now, so those were the test characteristics. Then we say, okay, is the CAM ICU-7 have any, does the score have any predictive validity for patients? And if you look at it, when you can capture delirium severity through the CAM ICU-7, it was a, so each point increase in CAM ICU-7 was associated with the higher odds of in-hospital mortality with an area under the curve of 0.785. And compared to delirium duration, that area under the curve was better, and this was significant. Whereas if you look at delirium severity, each point increase in delirium severity was associated with the lower odds of getting discharged home, and it performs as good, a little bit lower than delirium duration. And this was shown um, um, just for visual people, the curves on area under the curves for mortality, for delirium severity and delirium duration, as well as for discharge status. Then we say in order to be meaningful, the scale needs to have some cutoffs because whenever you go to clinicians, as, as clinicians, we really want some cutoffs. We want somewhere the scale need to be sliced. And then so we start doing some cutoffs with the predictive validity. And we said, if your score is from zero to two, you're not delirious. And then from three upwards, you have delirium with mild to moderate score is three to five and severe is six to seven and the maximum is score of seven. Now, there's a little bit of a caveat here on zero to two. I, we are doing some work now in which we are saying that no delirium means a score of zero, and a score of one and two means you have sub-syndromal delirium because that is associated with some clinical outcomes, and that will be showing later on, which kind of makes sense on a spectrum on that. All right. So this was the other follow. We said, okay, this shows, the CAM ICU-7 shows that it has a good test characteristics in the inpatient setting. What about um, over a long-term follow-up for mortality? And then we did a two-year follow-up among survivors, and you can see if you have a higher CAM ICU severity, you have a lower uh, chances of survival at two years. And these were the patients who survived the ICU stay, so the time point started after survival, uh, surviving the ICU. So. This is what um, this was what I wanted to talk about the scale development and doing the scale. Now I'm going to show you two trials uh, and then say how that scale has been used to assess for outcomes. Uh, this was the 
trial that was conducted at Eskenazi to test a multi-component intervention to reduce delirium duration, delirium severity in the ICU patients, and also to look at um, whether these um, multi-component measures are associated with reduced length of stay and mortality compared to usual care. I'm not gonna go over that. The three components though were low-dose haloperidol, reduce exposure to anticholinergics, <laughs> and reduce exposure to benzodiazepines. We assessed 12,000 patients for eligibility and um, 351 patients were enrolled um, to be included in the primary analysis. And then I'm just gonna show you this in the interest of time. You can see that on day eight, we were not able to decrease the duration of this delirium severity with our intervention. But if you look at, um, actually next slide, yeah. If you look at that on discharge, the CAM ICU-7, if you continue the intervention throughout the stay in the ICU was associated with the further reduction or further change in delirium severity compared to usual care showing that the scale along with its test characteristics is sensitive to change and is responsive to intervention. Now, this is a project that I think Sikandar is gonna talk further about in his way, but this is a new trial that we are initiating right now to try to reduce delirium using music in the ICU. And the outcomes you can see, one of the main, uh, one of the secondary outcome is delirium severity using CAM ICU-7. So we're gonna try to do further with music and see if we can reduce delirium severity. And the reason we started looking more into delirium severity because all of our prior work looking at delirium duration has come up to mostly negative trials with big trials all across the United States. We said, okay, as delirium severity is associated with long-term complications, maybe modifying that will provide long-term benefits to the population. All right, so the, the trial is pretty simple. It's a randomized trial with the music intervention. We're gonna assess patients for sedation, delirium, delirium severity, pain, and anxiety compare them with attention control. And at the time after discharge, we'll do this IUT bands, which is essentially a big cognitive battery at three months, which you can do over the phone, which we found out that in our prior studies that getting going to the homes of the patient provide another barrier. So if they have phone numbers, they can do things on phone better rather than giving you a time or come to do that assessment. We'll also do PHQ-9 and GAD-7 at that time to see if enrolled in this study in the ICU will provide beneficial experience long-term, at least up to three months after discharge. And then the other exciting ex aspect um, of the CAM ICU-7 work is after we published the results, we implemented in, um, in, um, at Eskenazi, and it is implemented in EPIC, and the nurses are using it twice a day on everybody. So not only doing CAM ICU, they're generating a score, and that score is being captured in EPIC, so they have about close to one and a half year worth of data. And we're in the process of having a data pool to see if the scale is performing in the real life setting the same way as it did in the clinical study setting. And this is one of the snapshot that you can see the top line that there was a patient who was admitted for a month in the intensive care unit. And you can see how the score is fluctuating. The, this is your CAM ICU-7 score, and this is your RAS score. And then close to the discharge, the score is going down. So you can capture the overall um, uh, stay and how their brain function was behaving or their delirium status was, and also on a day-to-day -day basis that now I can use during rounds. Or if you do an intervention, you can do another assessment and see if their CAM ICU-7 is reducing or not with that intervention. And at this time, I would like to thank everybody because this work would not be possible with obviously all these collaborators and all the folks here um, at um, Regan Street Institute. And I'm gonna show this, um, this slide because um, this brings it into perspective that um, why we do things uh, and why we're we doing uh, this kind of work. So I was in Costco and I saw this lady who follows up um, <laughs> in one of our places here. She was buying a cake and was I had in line in the queue and she was paying by herself and writing in her checkbook the you know so it was amazing that she was able to uh, and i asked her who she is buying this cake for and she said i'm buying it for me and today is my birthday and i'm not supposed to ask a lady her age but i just asked her i said well how old are you yeah. she said today i'm celebrating my hundredth birthday and she was yeah so she was there paying herself for her hundredth birthday and this is what we want to achieve in patients, whether they are admitted to the ICU or not admitted to the ICU, to have the brain function like her, so they can have their quality of lives as long as they live. 
And in the end, obviously, there's a pitch for everybody to come join us for the American Dream Society annual meeting from June 14 to 16. June 14th is going to be a pre-conference day where we'll go through Delirium 101 and we'll do simulations. So it's going to be here in this social hub, half of the day, all the presentations. And then we'll take everybody to the Fairbank Simulation Center so we can do CAM ICU and CAM and other delirium simulations. And people would get certification to do CAM assessments or other delirium assessment. And then June 15th and 16th will be at Weston. We'll have people coming from, I mean, usually people from like 16 countries come to this uh, meeting and then we have all international collaborators there. So who's and who of delirium will be there. So it would be great if you guys come over and talk to those folks. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> congratulations on the work. I think, uh, um, I, I like the simplicity of it, and I could imagine that in evaluating delirium, you know, we'll have a resident or med student several years from now say, you know, and their CAM 7 score was four. Right. You know, it's that simple. So uh, very, very elegant. Two quick questions. Um, did you develop this uh, in an unfunded way? In other words, you attached it to ongoing work. And the reason I ask is there's usually not much funding for developing scales. And second, do you intend to keep it public domain or make it proprietary? Because that's always a big decision on a scale. I have my own views on it. But uh, did you attach it to other funded work? And what's your intent on making it public domain versus proprietary? Right. Yeah, this was, so the answer to your first question, this was uh, attached on an ongoing work. Of, there's an, another study going, so I was able to attach to it. Because you're right, it's difficult to get funding for scale validation. Um, we are thinking about trying to do it in another population or something, so we may use this work to apply for funding. But this was a piggyback mm -hmm. on another big study that was going at that time. And then the second question is public domain and it can be used anywhere. It's an epic um, already. So the places who have epic, they can just go take it and use it. Um, it's available. You can see I even called the scale CAM ICU 7 because it was based on CAM ICU. Um, so yeah, it's available for everyone, not proprietary. We don't, I mean, we don't even have copyright. Sometimes people who want to translate, they send me emails and stuff and I, I let them translate to in other languages. Mm -hmm. The only thing I'd say, always request a copy of the translation, right. give them permission, but then you can archive translations because then it becomes more internationally used. Yep. Right. Okay. So in addition to the, what are some of the other risk factors for developing? Yeah, so um, in the ICU patients, um, there were four of them that have come out through systematic reviews, um, or there are actually a few more. But age is one, pre-existing cognitive impairment is another one. Um, uh, history of hypertension could do that. Um, there's some data on smoking. Uh, and then if you are in the ICU, each prior day of coma is, in, is a risk factor for developing delirium next year. Okay. 